Our mission is readiness. To be ready, we need to be able to train 24-7. If you're not able to train, then you're not able to fly, fight, and win, and more importantly, come back home. If we can't train our troops, if our soldiers cannot uh, do maneuvers, back, back, back. if they cannot fire their weapons, if we can't fly our helicopters, if we can't get our soldiers off of Fort Bragg to deploy anywhere around the world, then we don't need to be here. Our bases are the lifeline to who we are, how we train, and how we sustain our national defense. However, despite their vital importance, more and more of our training operations are drawing complaints from communities. Jet noise, it's all through the night, till three in the morning, and the kids can't get any sleep, the house is shaking. I mean, it's just like you're in a war zone. The problem is the increasing concentration of civilian development close to military installation. A situation that is both heightening sensitivity to noise and creating serious operational and safety problems for military training missions. seeing the development of communities that are trying to locate along uh, corridors and one of those being the Interstate 8 corridor which just happens to uh, border the northern border of the Goldwater Range. What we're concerned about is encroachment where we have uh, development in communities that are trying to build right up to the range boundaries which would not really be very compatible with uh, high-speed aircraft operating in close proximity to uh, family dwellings. Encroachment has affected how we fly aircraft at Cherry Point. Off runway 05, which is the main runway that's over the city of Havelock, the encroachment that's already in place causes us not to use that runway except when prevailing winds require that that's the only runway left. The growth in our surrounding counties has been phenomenal over the last 10 years. And in Fort Campbell in particular, over the last three years, we've increased almost 6,000 soldiers. Most military bases were located originally in relatively remote areas. However, the economic opportunities near installations have made them magnets for commercial and residential development. And today, communities are encroaching around military bases nationwide. Zones that were once kept clear to protect civilians from high noise levels and potential accidents are now the sites of homes, businesses, even schools and places of worship. We had uh, the potential encroachment uh, of a subdivision that was building very close to Sabre Army Heliport, which if that had gone unchecked, it would cause a noise and light issue for our pilots that had to use the night vision devices to do their flying at night, of which they're going to do in work. And so we had to work with the community of Clarksville that basically we ended up acquiring 130 acres of that land that stopped that because that would have infringed on our training for wartime. There's a lot of growth starting to happen to the southeast end of the installation. And so we're working uh, very diligently with uh, local jurisdictions to protect that land so that all of the jurisdictions can grow in a compatible way with the local community and the Air Force Base so we can continue to fly our mission safely. Noise and safety considerations are not the only factors involved. Tighter air quality standards, increased airspace congestion, reduced radio frequency spectrums, Endangered species and habitat protection and environmental requirements may restrict military operations and full use of training areas. Encroachment through inappropriate development around bases can hurt our uh, ability to train properly. We may have to deviate from normal uh, training uh, regimens 
and or the way we approach or, or take off from a base. And that does not in any way prepare us for the realities of war. Responsibility for controlling civilian development lies with state and local governments. Elected officials are charged with protecting the public health, safety, and welfare of their communities through judicious use of community planning programs, zoning and subdivision regulations, and building codes. At the same time, these officials are concerned with stimulating economic growth and balancing growth against regulations. We want to make sure that everybody's friendly, that we bring all the parties to the table and everybody can agree on what needs to happen for the best of the community, but also what needs to happen for the best of the military installation as well. As a property-owning neighbor, a military installation has the same rights to protection as anyone else in the community. As a steward of the installation and its mission, the base commander is ultimately responsible for protecting those rights by actively participating in local development planning and giving a strong voice to the installation's views and concerns. I see the base commander as the point of contact for the interface with the community. And the success or failure of that base commander with that interface uh, with the community boils down to how much he or she is willing to work outside the fence line. We have to be very proactive in how we handle everything we do with the community and ensure that we go out in advance, build those relationships so that when problems arise or when they're in the midst of planning, we are kept involved uh, and informed of everything that's going on. Congress and the Department of Defense have given base commanders some very effective tools for building understanding, encouraging dialogue, and exploring solutions. In 1973, the Navy and the Air Force instituted ACUS, the Air Installation Compatible Use Zone Program, and the Army began what it now calls its Operational Noise Management Program. The studies produced by these programs include detailed maps of the noise footprints and accident potential zones around military installations and suggest compatible land use activities that can protect and support community economic development. But state and local governments need help in understanding ACUs and operational noise management program data and applying it to their planning efforts. So in 1985, Congress authorized the Department of Defense to provide assistance to state and local governments to plan and carry out strategies where encroachment by a civilian community is likely to impair the operations of a military installation. The Compatible Use Program incorporates the Joint Land Use Study Program, or JLUS, as the means for delivering this assistance and helping states and communities to understand and apply ACUS and operational noise management program data to local planning and development efforts. Local commanders are invited to participate in the JLUS process, and throughout the country this close working relationship has spurred successful results. The joint land use study is largely a regional land use plan. And the way that land use plans work is they're kind of a road map or a dream sheet that kind of spells out how you would like for an area or community to be at some future time. The military installation needs to share what their operations are. What's the time frame of those operations? Does it occur in the morning? Are the things, operations happening after 10 p.m. at night? But the key is the communication aspect because unless there's open lines of communication between the city hall or the county board, the county seat, and the military. It's going to make it very difficult to implement whatever you come up with at the end of the day. Each JLUS participant has a role to play in its development. The base commander identifies a need by recommending a JLUS to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Military Service. The Deputy Assistant Secretary nominates a particular installation for a JLUS to the Director of the Office of Economic Adjustment, OEA. OEA then assigns a project manager to work with the nominated installation and affected community or state to determine whether sufficient basis exists to proceed with a JLUS. This review includes determining whether all parties support the effort. 
OEA offers technical and financial assistance, including guidance to initiate, conduct, and complete a JLAS. OEA may fund up to 90% of the cost to develop and or carry out a JLAS, while the local or state government ensures that not less than 10% of the cost is derived from non-federal sources. The affected community provides important leadership, including financial and political support, management of the JLUS, and carries out the JLUS recommendations. The objective is to support compatible use near our military installations, wherein military and community needs are met through a balanced effort. Planning and zoning are among the tools for controlling incompatible development, along with conservation buffers, development regulations, including transfer of development rights, subdivision and building codes, and real estate disclosures. We had a parcel of land right close to NAS Pensacola. That parcel could have been developed into a 98 uh, home residential subdivision. We went to the, the county, went to the developers and the landowners and explained to them uh, the potential impact that that would have. And we worked out a deal with them to purchase the property for $1.2 million. The Navy and the state of Florida were involved in the process and they both helped contribute to the purchase of that piece of land which we now own and we're turning it into a park. But some of the recommendations included um, real estate disclosure statements so that when people want to rent, lease, or purchase property that they would know ahead of time that their land is located within a mile of the fort and may be subject to low-level aircraft flights and levels of artillery and small arms noise. A properly developed and implemented JLUS can suggest to base commanders and communities alike effective methods to protect the health and safety of civilians, stimulate compatible civilian activity, and integrate the communities and the installation's plans in ways that help ensure the sustainability of both. An engagement with the community not only allowed me the opportunity to educate the community on what our flight operations are, but even more importantly, educate the community on what our airmen do day in and day out. Encroachment issues can create a tremendous financial and or operational impact on the U.S. military and the local communities. It doesn't have to be that way, though. By working together and planning for the future, we can create an, create an environment where we can both be successful together.